Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning and turn to 1 Corinthians, the first letter of Paul to the church at Corinth is where we're going to be at today. And I am super excited about this uh, series that we're embarking on. Um, here's the feedback from the first, sermon, uh, for, from the first service. Uh, it was good. Uh, how long are we going to be in 1 Corinthians? I said, well, it's not Romans, okay? We're not going to be in there as long as Romans, but I would say uh, until next year, for sure. So... I want to start by asking a question to you all, and I'm, I'm sincere. I'm not asking this as some theoretical thing. I'm asking sincerely, whose responsibility is it to change the world? As I woke up this morning, and I don't know how you live your life, but I live my life I go to bed, before I go to bed, I make the coffee and set the timer, and my timer goes off at 4.45, so it's ready for me at 5 a.m. to drink the coffee, because I want it fresh, and um, I get a cup of coffee, I stumble to the coffee pot, get a cup of coffee, and then uh, re- look at the news real quick, and um, we're apparently sending, the United States is sending 4,000 of our U.S. Marines and sailors to the Middle East, something is brewing. And I've got a lot of questions about that because that is not a conflict that Congress has authorized. We haven't declared war on anybody. And last time I checked, the man in the Oval Office is cognitively impaired. And so I've got a lot of questions about who's doing what and pulling what strings. Um, I'm not a fool. I can see with my own eyes what's going on. But... Assuming the best, and assuming that our motives are pure in the United States, and we're sending those troops over there to to keep peace or whatever, the U.S. military's job is very cut and dried. They kill people and break things for a living. And um, how many things are how many people do we got to kill, and how many things do we got to break to achieve peace in the Middle East? I don't know. But even if we kill enough people and break enough things to to achieve some modicum of peace in the Middle East. Is that going to change hearts and minds? I think the answer to that, we all know, is no. If anything, it's going to inflame hearts and minds for future conflict. Whose responsibility is it to change the world? Ultimately, God is in control, but God has placed here on the earth his people. And our mandate, our mission, if you will, is up here on the wall, and we talk about it all the time, is to love God, love others, and make disciples, make followers of Jesus Christ. We know, maybe the world doesn't know this, maybe we don't talk about this enough, but we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the message that can transform a heart in, from being a heart filled with hate towards another people group for some reason, maybe some historic reason, to being a person with a heart filled with love and compassion and joy. And so I would argue with you this morning that a big part of making this world a better place is that mission belongs to the church of Jesus Christ. And it is accomplished through love. God has ordained governments to kill people and break things. He has given them the power of the sword. But he has given us something so much more powerful. The good news of Jesus Christ. And so, if that's the case, I would then further argue that to the degree that the church is healthy and unified and thriving and strong, knowledgeable of God's Word, and also living it out, that we can make major, major strides to bring goodness and joy and peace with God and with our fellow man in this world. But when the church is broken, when there is disunity and disharmony, when there is sin that is unchecked, going on in the church, then it is not effective. In many circles, it becomes a byword. 
Oh, you believe in God? Well, look, look at the way you're living. In many ways, the, the first letter from Paul to the Corinthians that's recorded in Scripture is a letter to a church that is broken and in need of repair and building up. And the messages that are contained in Paul's letter are relevant to us today. And my whole effort today, my whole task before you is to just introduce you to this letter. That's all I'm going to do today, is I'm going to give you an introduction to 1 Corinthians and kind of a, an outline for 1 Corinthians that we're going to work through in the coming weeks and months. Let me tell you a little bit about this city. Corinth is a city that's located in the country of Greece on the Isthmus of, Isthmus of Corinth. can't say that word. Because of its strategic location and also the fact that it has three harbors, which is a big deal for maritime travel and trade, it became a center for commerce and trade. It became a center for economic development. And it, they accumulated wealth there. Many people from diverse backgrounds were attracted to the city of Corinth. I mean, you could, it makes sense, right? If, if things are booming in Corinth, if Corinth is really growing and there's a lot of economic prosperity and opportunity there, people are going to go there, much like people come to the United States all the time because what are they looking for? They're looking for a better life, economic prosperity and growth. But Corinth also made a name for herself for another reason, not just a wealthy city of opportunity, but with that wealth, combined with the worship of the goddess Aphrodite that, that had, as part of its worship rituals, cult prostitution, Corinth earned a reputation of being a city where one goes to experience moral decay. Before there was ever a Las Vegas, Nevada, there was Corinth. And before Las Vegas was called Sin City, Corinth earned that moniker first. If a person had involved themselves in immorality to the point that they had reached a point where it was difficult, if not impossible, for them to turn back, in other words, they were living such a lascivious lifestyle that they were just pretty far gone, that person was said back in those days to be Corinthianized. And perhaps you've heard someone refer to someone else disparagingly as a Corinthian. With the arrival of the Apostle Paul, however, Corinth started to become a center, not just for economics and prosperity and moral decay, but it became a center for Christianity. This seemed to be, if you read the book of Acts, Paul's way, his strategy was to go into the important cities and establishes, establish a group of believers, establish a church there. And that's what he did in Corinth. So let me give you a bit of a timeline. Paul arrives in Corinth around 50 AD and remains for 18 months. You can read about this in Acts chapter 18. He remains there for about a year and a half until about 52 AD. And you can tell, if you read Acts 18, that Paul's stay there was, not, was, was starting to be effective. And let me just say this. Nobody, if, if, if you are a person who's very outspoken in your own mind, nobody bothers you, right? Let me say that again. If you're a person that's outspoken in your own mind, people leave you alone, right? But when you are outspoken publicly and you start to get a following and you start to get popular and you start to change the way people are behaving maybe even making a dent in some of their economic, you know, for example, if the, uh, if the business at the local prostitution center goes down and people start losing money, eh, people get upset. In the case of the Jews, if the people stop going to synagogue and are starting to now worship in the local church, eh, people get upset. So you can tell that Paul was having some level of effectiveness because in 51 AD, Acts chapter 18 says, the Jews of the city went to Lucius Junius Gallio, who was the Roman proconsul, and tried to bring Paul up on charges. What were the charges? These people are worshiping God instead of the God of Rome, and that is illegal. And the Roman proconsul, who was probably a, he was a, a man for his time, 
living in Corinth, probably fully imbibed into the culture. And he said, listen, guys, they're not bothering anybody. Paul's not bugging anybody. This has to do with your matters of religion and whatever, and I don't want to get involved in any of this. And they even got so upset, the Jews got so upset about this that they drug a guy named uh, Stevanus out and uh, beat him up a little bit, and the pro council did nothing about it, just looked on. So there was conflict in Corinth around Paul. About 52 AD, Paul leaves Corinth for Ephesus with Priscilla and Aquila in tow, and he sets up his ministry headquarters in Ephesus at that time, leaving behind a church, a, a, a group of believers at Corinth, and there they attempted to live for Jesus Christ. Things did not go well. From Ephesus, Paul writes a letter to the church at Corinth. This letter is re referenced in the Bible, but we do not have it. It's not preserved in the Bible for us today. It's just referred to in the Bible. Paul later wrote another letter around 55 AD, and that is the letter that we are studying. That is the letter that is known as 1 Corinthians. Later, Paul circled back and went and visited the church at Corinth again and wrote them another letter. This is referenced in 2 Corinthians as the painful visit, and the letter is referred to as the tearful or severe letter. We don't have that letter either. And then a few months later, Paul wrote yet another letter, which we now know as 2 Corinthians, and he wrote that in about 56 AD. So there's the timeline for you. This was a church that was immature. It was growing, but immature, and they had problems. They weren't dealing with these problems biblically, and so Paul was interacting with them. Now, let's talk about the structure of this letter for a little bit. The structure of this letter, if anybody's ever gone on a website, and you've, you've went to the frequently asked questions section of the website, I do that a lot. I don't know if you guys do, but um, if I have questions for somebody or something, I typically go to their website, go to the FAQ, and I get my questions answered because it's a frequently asked question. And, and so this letter can feel like an FAQ, with the exception of the introduction, right, where Paul greets them and all this kind of stuff, and, and the salutation at the end. There's a lot of things that are in this letter that are, it's obvious that the Corinthians have written Paul or he's heard things about the church at Corinth and he's addressing them one by one and they are set off by the phrase, now concerning, in your English Bible. Now concerning this, let me tell you what I think. Now concerning that, let me tell you what the Lord says. Now concerning, now concerning, now concerning. And you'll see that phrase often as we work our way through the book. The topics are wide ranging, but they all have one thing in common. They have to do with practical Christian living, especially within the church. A lot of First Corinthians, almost all of it, is regarding the church. Now let's talk about some of the features in First Corinthians. Uh, after you get through the greeting and the salutation and the initial stuff, in chapter five, we read about a church discipline case that Paul is talking about. Um, it's a pretty, there's some pretty egregious sin going on, and Paul instructs the church what to do about it. In chapter 7, uh, this is a, a passage of Scripture that's referred to often in, re in terms of marriage. There's instructions here for married people and unmarried people in, in chapter 7. Some teaching had come into the church that was false, and Paul deals with it, right? In chapter 8, uh, Paul talks about food offered to idols, and he instructs the church on what to do with this meat that's been uh, involved in the temple system of the false gods, what are they, how are they to think about that? How are they to live uh, in regard to eating or not eating that meat? In chapter 10, verse 13, we get this famous verse that many of us have memorized, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is a very hope-filled passage of Scripture that many depend on to get through the day. In chapter 11, there's a passage of Scripture in there that churches all over the world read when they gather to celebrate the Lord's table. And we will read it again tonight when we gather at 6 p.m. to take the Lord's table. It's part of a wider context where Paul is talking to the church about their, their practice of the Lord's table. Uh, but we will read that passage again tonight. Chapter 12 Paul uses the analogy of the fact that there's one body, the body of Christ, but many members. And he uses the analogy of the, of the human body. The human body has ears, and they don't do the same things as the eyes, 
but it's all one body. And, and he makes reference to that in saying that in this church, we're all different. Uh, some of you have such and such talents, gifts, abilities. Some of you have other completely different talents, gifts, abilities. And yet we're all part of one body. Very interesting, very helpful for us to think through as we think about the church. Chapter 13 is the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, all these things. And that chapter is read the most at what event? Weddings. Now, I'm not opposed to reading that at weddings, I've done it myself. But is that chapter, is, Roman, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13 primarily about love and marriage? It is not. What's it about? Love where? In the church. It's talking about love in the church. Now, love is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the world today. People bandy that word about all the time. Love is love. All these things. But if you want to have a very complete understanding of what biblical love is or what love is according to God, the 13 verses in 1 Corinthians 13 will do the trick. You will have a thorough understanding if you reach a thorough understanding of 1 Corinthians 13. First, uh, first chapter 14 talks about spiritual gifts, tongues, and prophecies. That'll be a challenging time for us to get through. Chapter 15 talks about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, read at gravesides, almost every graveside service I've ever done, I've read a little bit of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's an interesting book. It starts, right, it starts with Paul telling us who we are. We'll get into that in a minute. Who we are, and then it talks about a whole bunch of practical stuff about Christian living. And then towards the end, chapter 15, it talks about where you're going. Right? You're going to die, and then you're going to experience the resurrection of the dead as Christ did. And so the big question today that we're going to wrestle with is, what can we take away from an overall view of this letter? The first letter to the church at Corinth. And in the remaining time that I have, which is not much, I'm just going to give you an outline of the book and just talk briefly about it. We'll start digging in next week. And I hope this outline will be helpful for you, something that you can tuck in your Bible or in your study materials at home and ref refer back to it as we work our way through. The first, the first, in the first chunk of the book, Paul just challenges us to do this. No, I'm back alive. Okay. <clears throat> Resurrection. The first thing that Paul challenges us to do in the book, in the first nine verses of the book, it's a very condensed but very meaningful section of the book, is to remember who you are in Christ. One of the greatest challenges that we face as Christians is living in this world where the world is constantly challenging us on who we are. It's constantly telling us that we're somebody other than who God says we are. You're not a creation of God, unique and purposeful. You are a random chance that happened through macroevolution, and, and there's no real meaning to your life. You're just going to kind of be born and die. That's what the world is telling us. The world is telling us to buy into an identity based on something other than God, a hobby, a profession, a sexual orientation, whatever. The world is constantly challenging us, our young people, whatever, to buy into an alternate reality of who we are. And Paul starts off his letter by saying, let me remind you who you are. Let me just read to you the first few verses. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now, I just want to stop right there and say, and we'll talk about this next week, to the church of God. Let me put that in as plain as farm boy English as I possibly can. To the gathering of people who are gods, who belong to God. They're not, you're not gods, but you belong to God. God's apostrophe as possessive. You 
belong to God. You are God's people. Never let anybody make you forget that. You are God's people. You are the gathering of people who belong to Him. That in and of itself is an amazing statement. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified, set apart, you've been set apart for a specific purpose in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. You've been called together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're not just one single group of people. You are a multitude of groups of people that are united in this common faith in Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to go on in a very condensed way, a very, very few verses. He's going to remind the people of Corinth who they are. We must not forget something that we constantly have to remind ourselves. The world is going to try to identify us by our political persuasion, by our skin color, by all these different ways. None of that is who you are. You are a saint. You are a person of God in Christ. And that is filled with meaning. Secondly, and I hope this goes without saying, unity within a church, it's not negotiable. This is not something that it would be nice to have. This is something that is a must-have, right? The church in Corinth is suffering from a whole slew of things that are dividing them. They, they have a cult of personality. Paul says, some say I'm of Paul. Some say I'm of Apollos. Some say I'm of, of Cephas, who is Peter. Some say that I'm of Christ. They're suffering from a cult of personality. We have that in the church today. I'm a follower of John MacArthur. Well, I'm a follower of Tim Keller. Tim Keller, he's the devil. I'm a follower of Joel Osteen. No, the name that shall never be mentioned. Joel, Joel Osteen. You get the idea. They're divided. They're divided. They're, they're, there's another faction in the church that's disputing over whether we should do things God's way or the world's way. And Paul says, no, we've got to do God's business God's way. There's a faction in the church that's impressed by lofty speech. Oh, we must, brothers and sisters, bask in the infralapsarian reality of our sanctified positionality in the whole... No, he says, stop that. It's not about that. It's about learning doctrine so that we can roll up our sleeves and do the nitty-gritty work of loving and building up one another and being clear with one another. We find our unity when we unite our lives in the work of doing God's will. When we choose not, when we have a brother or sister in Christ that we're in conflict with and choosing not to go behind their back to another group of believers and disparage their name, but instead go to that person and to the best of our ability try to work the conflict out. Unity within the church is not negotiable. I am going to stomp on toes during this section of our time together and I apologize in advance. But these are things that we must, these are skills that we must master. Three, do not be a Christian in name only. There were apparently a group of people teaching in the church who were, who were big on talk but small on action. They had what, what some refer to, Randy Patton specifically refers to, as they were wet watermelon seed Christians. You know, it's summertime, you're probably eating some watermelon. We have seedless watermelon today, so we're blessed. But for those of you that prefer the seeded variety, you know what I'm talking about. You, you spit out the wet watermelon seed on the table or on your plate, and you put your thumb on it, and what happens? You put a little bit of pressure, where does it go? Shoots away, right? That's what a lot of Christians are like. They, they talk a big talk, but they get a little bit of pressure. Maybe it's a trial. Maybe it's a little bit of conflict. They get a little bit of pressure in their life, and they're gone. Paul encourages the church at Corinth to endure hardship for the sake of the gospel. First, chapter 4, verse 20, 1 Corinthians 4, 20 says, For the kingdom of God does not exist in talk, but in power. It exists not in talk, but in power. Power is the word dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. It means 
the ability to be effective, to get things done. This is not, the kingdom of God is not about empty talk. So don't be a Christian in name only. Fourth, deal with sin in the church as God directs. You can imagine that if there's open, unrepented of sin going on in any church, and everybody knows it, right? There's somebody on this side of the room that has offended somebody on this side of the room, and they're not talking, and in fact, they're not just not talking, they're gossiping about each other, it's getting ugly, everybody in the church can see it, it's corrosive to the body of Christ. Paul simply says to them, deal with this sin as God directs. In the church of Corinth, there was sexual immorality going on, and people were uh, taking each other to court, and it was not good. It was open. They were kind of proud of themselves for being so open-minded as to let these folks continue to worship in the body. No. This will be a difficult section to work through for us as a church because in the church today, we've, we've grown this really weird tendency for when there's conflict between two parties or, or there's sin, there's been sin committed between, from one person to another that, we, that for some reason some churches have adopted this mentality that if you say, I'm sorry, if you mouth the words, I'm sorry, or you mouth the words, please forgive me, that's, that, that's it, and the relationship should return back to the time before the sin ever happened. But that's not reality, brothers and sisters. Repentance is a blessing, and it's available to all believers, but sin brings damage and distrust, and it takes time to repair and to rebuild. That's the biblical truth. And there are many believers, trust me when I say, there are many, many believers who say, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? I want to repent of this thing. But then you, you ask them to do one thing in taking one step towards repentance and whew, they're gone. They're gone. Don't be, or deal with sin in the church as God directs. The fifth thing that we see in the book, and this is cha- found in chapter 7, that, that chapter on marriage and, and being single and all this kind of stuff, is don't deny yourself what God has given in the name of God. In other words, what was going on there is Paul is combating what's known as asceticism. Asceticism. There are some in the church of Corinth that have taken up the belief, I can be closer to God if I simply, as a man, tell myself not to have, I'm not going to have sexual relations with a woman. I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to participate in that whole thing. I'm just going to devote myself to God. And Paul says, mm, you're missing the boat. Marriage, that's a gift from God. And all the things that come with it, that's a gift of God. And it's better to get married than it is to burn with passion. There's a tendency among Christians, but also people of all religions, to think that denying ourselves of something that God has given us for our good will bring us closer to God. Paul addresses this situation with great skill and very practical advice and informs the church of the right way to think about this matter. This will be a very, I think, an an eye-opening and good section. Don't deny yourself what God has given and do it in the name of God. Six, practice faithful obedience to God's word. Practice faithful obedience to God's word. And in in this section of the text, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, we learn a lot about Not being just mindful of yourself, but being mindful of how your actions and your your words affect other people, right? Others in the body. Remember, a big theme, well, maybe you haven't said it yet in the service because, you know, but a big theme running through 1 Corinthians is this idea of building up the church, of edifying the church. And you can't do that if you're a lone ranger. You have to take what you're doing and what you're saying in context of how other people are going to receive it. And so a lot of this has to do with whole food offered to idols. And I know that the idol isn't real, so I, in my conscience, feel like I can eat this food. But the the person that I'm with has a a conviction against eating food offered to idols. And so I need to be mindful of him or her as I'm operating my life. We talk a lot about, and the text talks a lot about our rights. We talk a lot about that today in this world. Well, I have the right to do this, and I have the right to do that, and I have the right to carry a firearm, and I have the right to freedom of speech. You do have the right of freedom of speech. In the United States of America, you have the right to freedom of speech. But it's not always edifying to use it. 
willy-nilly. Be willing to sacrifice your rights for the good of others. Seventh, tr uh, learn to avoid legalism. And here, I, I find that there's much confusion on this topic of legalism. Some people ascribe something as being legalistic that's not really legalistic. You know, like for example, uh, uh, people will, will say that um, Delaware Christian School is legal, legalistic because it has a, a dress code that's not legalism, that doesn't pass the, any kind of test for legalism. There's a dress code, you know. You don't have to go to the school, right? But if you do go to the school, you've got to follow a dress code. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're not like tying that to scripture or anything. We're just saying the school has a dress code. And so a good definition and practical wisdom will be helpful as we talk about legalism in, in this seventh part. And eighth, fulfill your role in God's plan. And here I'm going to get all kinds. I'm, I'm, there's, there's like landmines. Imagine that in this uh, auditorium there's like landmines everywhere. And I'm probably going to step on every one of them. But we're going to talk about men's roles and women's roles in the church because it's in God's word. And I find today that almost in almost every case, almost without exception, that the way Christians talk about men's roles, but more specifically women's roles, is they talk about it in the negative. Well, women can't do this, and women can't do that. And, and I want to change that narrative a little bit. I want to talk about men's roles and women's roles in the positive. God's design is wonderful if we will embrace it and live in it. And that, that model that we're going to, that Paul's going to talk about is wonderful when it is done according to God's word. Ninth, think of we more than me. Think of we more than me. And here in chapter 11, Paul addresses the Lord's table. Apparently what was going on in the church in Corinth was there were some richer, more well-to-do people, and they were coming to the Lord's table. Maybe they were supplying the money to buy the food for the Lord's table, gathering at the church, and they put on this big meal and everything like this, and the rich people were showing up and getting first in line, and they were taking all the food, leaving nothing for the less well-to-do people at the end of the line. Paul castigates them for that, for that way of living and thinking. And, in, and encourages them to consider one another in, in everything, but specifically in the Lord's table, to wait on one another and to make sure everyone is taken care of in that celebration. Oh, what would the world be like if the church adopted a mentality of we? I want to edify the body. It's not about me. I want to, I want to do what's right according to God's word to build up the body. It'd be a different world. A few more things. Tenth, practice being a builder of the body of Christ. Now, my appetite is wet for this section. It's three chapters, and I'm doing this when I think about chapter 12, 13, 14. Can't wait to get to chapter 12, 13, 14. And as you read through 1 Corinthians, and I pray that you will, look for the language. It's not just in these three chapters, by the way. It's, it's, it's many places in 1 Corinthians. You'll, you'll, you'll read language about building up the body of Christ, edification of the body of Christ, encouraging the body of Christ. That's a big part of what 1 Corinthians is all about. And so you must practice being a builder of the body of Christ. I don't know why in the timeline of my life this happened, but yesterday, just yesterday, I finished a year-long process of refinish, or, uh, re uh, remodeling our bathroom, master bathroom and master bedroom. Uh, it took me a year, and I, had to, I even had to call help. I had to call a guy to help me with the project and all this kind of stuff. And it, you know, I'm not all that good at, you know, I'm really good at tearing things down. I'm not all that good at, like, finished carpentry and making the joints line up and all this kind of stuff. And I learned that... Um, that caulk covers a multitude of sins. I, I learned that lesson big time. And I learned how to do a better job at uh, doing that. But it's a step-by-step -step process. First, you, you rip off the bad stuff, and then you patch up the holes, and then you lay down the new flooring, and you paint the wall, and you put up the wainscoting, and you install the toilet and the shower and the sink and all this. It's a step-by-step -step process. 
And I want you to start thinking about this church, Delaware Bible Church, as a construction project. Except we're not building just a building. We're building up each other. We're making sure that our adults, our men, our women, our young people, teenagers, even children, are receiving sound doctrine in their Sunday school classes. We're making sure to challenge one another to put the sound doctrine that's in our heads, like George said about the sponge, you know, to not just, not just store up sound doctrine in our heads and become proud, right? Uh, the analogy that I think of when I think of a sponge is, and just absorbing things is you sit, soak, and sour, right? You sit, soak, and then what you've soaked in becomes sour. No, we got to encourage one another and challenge one another to put that which God has deposited in our lives into action in building up the body of Christ and reaching out to the lost world with the message of Jesus Christ. There is much evangelistic work to be done in Delaware County. Who in here, and I'm ashamed I'm not going to raise my hand, I don't think probably anybody will raise their hand, who in here has begun to study the culture that's moving in on the south edge of our county and moving up, the, all the Indian folks that are moving in, who has begun to research and to think about how are we going to reach this population with the good news of Jesus Christ? We've got work to do. And my argument this morning is that in order for us to do that work effectively, we must be strong and growing. And in order for us to be strong and growing, each one of us has to be strong and growing as individual believers and followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it's going to take. We must become builders. In this section, he'll talk about spiritual gifts of tongues and prophecies and all that kind of stuff. But the tongues... Listen, if you're waiting to get to chapter 14 so that you can hear Pastor Scott's official position on speaking in tongues, you're going to be disappointed because I'm, I'm going to talk about that, but the big thrust of chapter 14 is going to be building up the body of Christ. Everything has to be done for building up, for edification, for encouragement, for consolation. Everything has to be done. And that's the context in which Paul talks about speaking in tongues and prophecy. It's not about those things in and of itself. It's about building up the body. Two more things. Death to self is the only way to truly live. And here, he's, this is chapter 15, and he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and how that applies to how what's going to happen to us and how we ought to live our lives in light of that. And again, I just want to call your attention to the fact that at the beginning of the book, Paul says, here's who you are. You are saints, you are called, you are set apart, you are the people of God, you're the congregation, the church of God. He tells us where we are, then he spends the whole book, talks about how we ought to live, and at the end of the book here in chapter 15, because there's only 16 chapters, he says where you're going when it's all over, and it's good. You're going to go be with the Lord. And he concludes that section with a challenge, uh, chapter 15, verse 58, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Is that you? Could you say, if the Lord called you up on your cell phone and said, hey, have you been steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord? Could you say yes to that question? It's time to make some changes, brothers and sisters. It's time for us to, to get going here. And then finally, chapter 12 it's just the very beginning part, stretch to make what you build here a blessing to other local bodies. And here Paul instructs the church at Corinth, hey, uh, take a little bit every week and set it aside, and then when, when I come and take up a collection for the saints in other places, you know, other churches that are struggling, then you'll have something to give and we won't have to take up a collection. And I'm going to probably apply that pretty broadly to say, listen, to the extent that we can grow and, and become strong and effective as a church, then we will become a center that can then help other churches and equip other churches to do the same, right? 
we could invite them in. Probably they'll be knocking on our door wanting to come in and say, how are you being so effective? We want to learn and grow, and we want to do that as well. In order for us to become strong, because, that we all have to agree that we're going to work on our spiritual life and on our ministry in the church and beyond. Stretch to make what you build here a blessing to other local bodies. Again, the overall theme of building, uh, building up the body of Christ that's found in 1 Corinthians is what struck me as I've read through it at this particular time. And so I just want to I just want to finish by reading a, a brief portion of scripture, making a point, and then I'll I'll finish up. Chapter 3, verse 10 and following says, According to the grace of God given to me. And just listen to this. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. Chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, he's talking, this is Paul, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. He's talking about the church in Corinth. I laid a foundation. And someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. You know, before I read more, Carl Witt and those that have come before us, they've laid the foundation for who we are today. They've laid the foundation of Delaware Bible Church. And now we're all builders. And we're building on the work that they laid down. So think about yourself as I read this. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And by here, fire here, I believe he's talking about trials, hardship, difficulty. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. As I, as I wrap up, let me, just, let me just make one last point, and that is this. At the beginning of the book, at, several po- at the beginning of this letter, at several points throughout the letter, and towards the end of the letter, Paul basically, I'm paraphrasing heavily, but basically says this. God has said, you are this. You are a part of the people of God. You are sanctified. You are holy. You are set apart. You are called to this work. But church in Corinth, you're living like this. You're down here in the muck of the mire of what the rest of the world is doing. Sexual immorality, taking each other to court, all this kind of nonsense and disunity. You're living like the rest of the world. What I'm asking you to do, church in Corinth, is to live as if you are truly the the people that live out what God called you to be. I'm asking you to live out what God has told you that you are. Live it out. Work and strive to become who God says you are. And don't settle for down here. And that's what I want us to take away from this as well. The answer to the big question, what can we take away from this? The first letter of the church is, at Corinth provides practical instructions for life as a church. But the overall message seems to be that everything should be done to build up the church so that it can accomplish the mission of making followers of Jesus Christ. We have a mission. Love God, love others, make disciples. Are we intentionally building up this body to make that mission happen? That's the question that we all have to wrestle with. So, in light of that, let me give you some practical application. Uh, Number one, I would challenge you to read or listen to 1 Corinthians this week. I talked to a fellow out in the hallway who says that listening to things really helps him absorb it the best. I'm a reader. But I was out on a a, uh, jog the other day, which some people would call a speed walk, 
And I, I went like four or five miles or something, but I was able to listen to the whole book of 1 Corinthians in one trip. So it, very easily you could listen to it or read it this week, 16 chapters, take you a couple hours. And I'm serious, I would, I'm thinking of all the ways I can embarrass anybody next week who didn't read it. I don't think I can come up with anything, but you should definitely read, read it. And pay attention to the language of building up in it. You'll see it if you pay attention. Secondly, pray for a heart that wants to learn and grow through 1 Corinthians. For this church to become strong, you're going to have to become strong. For this church to grow, you're going to have to grow. I, I can't say it any other way than that. I can stand up here and tap dance, right? It's not going to grow the church. It's not going to make us stronger. It's not going to make us more effective at the ministry. We, each one of us, me included, we have to grow and change and become more like Christ. And then finally, consider how you can use your gifts to build up this church, then practice, practice, practice. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. Some of you have the gift of teaching. Some of you have the gift of administration. Some of you have gifts that I can't even name. Use them to build up the body of Christ and refuse to let anyone or anything tear this place apart. Refuse to allow Satan to have any kind of in in this body. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to study this book in overview format today. And Father, as we dive in next week to the first nine verses of chapter one, pray that you would help us to see and to become who you've called us to be. And to not settle for worldliness in our ranks. To not settle for less than we can become. If we follow your word, diligently apply it, and put it into practice in our everyday life, Father, we know your word is powerful and effective. And we know that your Holy Spirit is active in our lives. You've given us what we need, Father. As we make attempts, haltingly, maybe at first, and stiltingly, that you would you would help us to transform and grow more and more into the image of your son. That you would make Delaware Bible Church an effective tool in your hands. Father, that this world would change. Revival would come. That many would give their lives to you. You're the only one that can save. You're the only one who really loves. And we can only love because you first loved us. We thank you for your love in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, 6 p.m., the Lord's table. Be there or be square. See ya. You're dismissed.